And with that, uh, we will segue into our next talk. So, uh, so as I mentioned uh, last year, uh, I've known Eric now for a couple of years, and um, he's uh, he's a professor of Belmont University, and uh, we. Um, we connected early on when I first started doing my juice tutorials and I was very, uh, was very humbled when he was telling me that he was showing some of his students, the, uh, tutorials that, that I had been doing as a beginner, which was very humbling and really just motivated me to do more of it. So, um, if I haven't told you this already, Eric, thank you very much because, uh, that, that conversation was so motivating for me. Um. And um, and we've connected at various times through the years. Eric also uh, teaches a lot of uh, audio programming. He has a platform called Hack Audio. Uh, so he has a Patreon page where he's done workshops on circuit modeling and um, and other tutorials using Juice. Uh, and um, I caught his talk um, last year at uh, the audio developer conference in london where uh where he was speaking about his new circuit modeling library called point to point modeling and uh we struck up a conversation and um we had talked about how uh how excited the community would be to hear more about this library and uh and its uses and uh the intent of this uh at the risk of speaking for eric is to make uh something that's that's uh, a very complex topic which is circuit modeling in um in the audio domain um a lot easier for people who are looking to get into this and so eric's done a lot of great work with this and um and with that i will pass the mic over to eric now to take over and to talk about this amazing library uh so take it away eric thanks josh i couldn't have said it better myself uh thanks to you and everybody at uh whole team at the audio programmer for uh organizing these monthly uh meetups and streams. I think they're fantastic resources for people. And um, yeah, I'm really excited and appreciative of the chance to uh, share with your community a tool that I've been uh, working on developing um, for people that are making audio software with the idea that um, in a lot of cases, people want to do things like create audio effects that are based off of uh, hardware. So taking something like an analog circuit and being able to turn that into computer code and trying to make that easier and more approachable and accessible for just about anyone that uh, would like to do that. So um, most of my presentation today is going to be just some demonstrations about how to use the library, uh, but I will go through just a couple uh, slides, uh, background information um, about that as I switch over and start sharing my screen. Um, and then we'll jump right into some uh, code to look at. So uh, I did share a little bit of this uh, information already at the ADC, but for those, um, I guess that this would be new. Um, the uh, name of this library I've called point-to-point -point modeling, um, and the goal of it is to do automatic uh, circuit solving. So make it as easy as possible, um, having a computer do a lot of the work. And when I think about this tool and what I set out to do, uh, when starting to work on it, the goal was to really focus on analog circuit modeling and make it for everyone. Um, whether that be someone that is uh, uh, already experienced with doing a lot of DSP stuff and just wants a tool to make their lives easier, or for someone that uh, could actually care less about all the uh, nuances of, of analog circuit modeling and they just want something that already works and does a lot of the uh, stuff for them and everything in between. So just to share a few more um, details about it, the particular type of circuit modeling that's included in this library is uh, what's called component level modeling or physically informed modeling, where um, what we like to do is be able to recreate the entire circuit from the beginning of the circuit to the end of the circuit and all the components that make up that circuit. We like to write some computer code that does what that circuit does. Uh, you can compact, uh, contrast that to this whole idea of um, uh, machine learning in black box types of ways of learning how systems work. Um, that's cool, and I've done lots of fun stuff uh, with that approach to circuit modeling as well. Um, but this approach is more about, all right, let's 
figure out if you were to open up the hardware or open up a guitar pedal and look at what components are inside of that pedal, how do we do that? Uh, and, you know, I know that just to kind of uh, address some of the uh, things that people might think about initially um, with this is, you know, isn't that a complicated thing to do? You know, that's uh, not a trivial thing to have to work on. And, you know, I, I think with this library, the goal is to say, yeah, I totally in agreement with that. And let's automate a computer to do that. You know, I have spent a lot of time in my own life studying circuits and learning the mathematics behind uh, how you can model them. But even for me, like when I work on complicated circuits, uh, it is actually easier and I get better results if I have this tool that automates the whole process and there's less places for me to make mistakes in my own uh, math when I'm doing it by hand and that kind of stuff if I have this tool that, at, that does the component level modeling already. So even for me, as someone that, that uh, works on modeling, that this type of automation approach to it is something that I actually uh, prefer myself. Um, and you might also say, hey, I'm a kind of person that circuits aren't really my specialty. Maybe you're a uh, uh, person that focuses on the front end developer, or you're a you know indie developer that's working on your own plugins, and you're expert at the graphics and um, the user experience and that kind of stuff. But you want some really cool DSP. Well, uh, what this library offers, including the uh, way of automating the circuit solving process is that it also includes over 150 prepared circuits for you. If you were to use this library, these circuits are already made up ahead of time. And these are your classic circuits um, from all over the field of audio, from uh, filters and equalizers you might find in a, a console or like a preamp in a console or guitar pedals and guitar amplifiers. And those kinds of circuits are ones that have already been prepared ahead of time and are there for someone to be able to use if they say, you know what, I don't want to have to actually worry about the circuit itself. I just want to have some cool DSP that sounds like analog stuff. This is what the library is um, capable of, of uh, doing right out of the box. Um, but if you're the kind of person that you, uh, you are interested in circuits and nerd out on it like I do, um, the you know the circuit ha uh, the library has this arbitrary circuit solver the ability to for you to put in your own custom designs stuff that's not even included in the library uh, as long as you use certain components uh, the common standard components of a lot of audio circuits for you you can put those things in and I'll show you exactly how to do that um, the the library will figure out the mathematical model for the uh, circuit for you and allow you to easily just drop that in to your uh, software and be able to use it um, so I think the best way to take a look at what this library is capable of doing is going through an example. And so what I'm showing you here on the screen is a circuit. This is about as simple or basic of a circuit as um, we might want to be able to ever use in audio. This is a low pass filter. Um, and this type of diagram is called a schematic. If this is uh, brand new to you. So a schematic describes um, the connections of a circuit and the components of the circuit. Uh, so in a circuit, we care about where the signal is starting out, the input of it. You can think of it like a guitar pedal and where you plug your um, signal from your guitar into that pedal. And then we have an output to the circuit and um, where we get the signal, the output jack of the guitar pedal and send it on to do something else. And what we want to do is model that uh, circuit that's inside of it. So um, it is the case that it's helpful to understand some basics of circuits, like the fact that our signal in the case of an analog circuit is carried as a voltage. And um, voltage is related to this other concept in uh, circuits called current. And so some of those basic things are helpful to have an idea about if you're like brand new to it and you're trying to be able to get up to speed on even just using this library. What do I need to know to be able to? Um, uh, implement some code. I'm, maybe you're familiar with C++ code, and that's great. Um, but in order to really get the most out of the library, um, it's helpful to at least have a foundation uh, in those things. So this uh, circuit then is made up of some components. Uh, we have a voltage source over here um, is where our circuit or our signal is going to come in. 
And we have a thing called a resistor uh, with the abbreviation R. And we have a capacitor over here. Um, that's a, an abbreviation C. They're just different um, circuit components, or what I also call circuit elements, um, as a way to distinguish a component. In because a lot of people are using juice component is right a graphics element, and so I don't want to um, mix up those terms. And so I call these things uh, circuit elements, a resistor, and a capacitor. So the name of this circuit right here is called an RC low pass filter. It is going to uh, reduce the amplitude of high frequencies and allow the low frequencies to pass through. And so if you were to compare our output signal over here, uh, the voltage that uh, is across the capacitor here compared to the one at the input, uh, it would be the case that the high frequencies have been filtered out. So this is the schematic. And really, the main thing to understand about it is to be able to recognize what elements are part of it and then also where those elements are connected. And in a circuit, the connections between elements are called nodes. Uh, and so you need to be able to recognize where the nodes are going to occur. And those are the places, the points of wires in between the components. So here we have a node, I've numbered them already. We have a node over here. I've just said, this is node one between the voltage source and the resistor. This is node two over here between the resistor and the capacitor. And in the circuit, there's usually a reference node that's called ground. A lot of people have heard of ground because it's a, a point in like when you plug into a, a power outlet, uh, there's usually a prong in your connection that goes on and connects um, you know, your plug to ground. So um, these are, are things to be able to recognize in a schematic to then be able to use a library uh, to be able to turn this into code. And so on the next slide, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I'm going to show you as a developer, um, if you were to use this library, the extent at which you need to be able to um, uh, look at a schematic and then how to take that information and put it into code that then can be turned into um, you know, software, a plugin or an app or any uh, type of C++ software that you would want to create. So over here, um, is a class for implementing this uh, RC low pass filter. <clears throat> and so the way that the library works is you inherit from this generic thing called a circuit. And you then give your own unique name to the circuit that you're trying to create. So this one is a specific type of RC low pass filter. Uh, it's a first order one and it's passive. It doesn't amplify the signal. It doesn't have an, uh, like an op amp to it. Um, and so this is just the name that I've given this particular circuit. Uh, so in the constructor is really the only thing you have to specify um, in order to um, uh, translate this schematic over to uh, some computer code. So in the constructor of it, what you're going to do is um, create something called a layout. The layout is essentially the schematic of the uh, circuit. And so you're going to specify the number of nodes that are included. So over here, we have two nodes other than ground. So we have one and two. So that's the number of nodes. And we have to say then where the circuit elements are connected and add them to our circuit layout. So we have a voltage input. We need to recognize where that is. And the voltage input goes from node one down to node zero. So it connects up here to node one and goes down here to node zero. Then we have the voltage output that uh, connects from node two down to node zero. So we need to specify where that's going to be. Uh, and then we can put in our circuit elements. So like our resistors and our capacitors. And because this uh, library is capable of handling an arbitrary number of resistors and capacitors and other elements uh, that are part of it, what we do is we create the single instances of those resistors, and then we add them to a vector that goes into our layout. So you could have one resistor or you could have uh, 10 resistors. It's really up to your circuit um, for how you put them in. So a resistor has some value uh, in ohms. So that's the unit of resistance. And in this case, I have a resistor that has 4,700 ohms uh, is its value. And then it connects from node one over to node two. I take that single resistor and I put it into my vector that goes to my layout. I do the same thing for the capacitors. So capacitors um, have uh, units of farads. So this is uh, nanofarads. 47 nanofarads is the uh, capacitor right here. And even though I didn't include it on my schematic, if you were to go out and look for audio schematics for your favorite kinds of circuits, 
uh, they are usually going to give you the values of the elements in it. So you say this resistor has you know, this value and so on. So this capacitor goes from node two down to node zero. Uh, we put that in our vector and then we take the whole layout and we pass it into this thing called a circuit model. And that's where the magic of the library happens. All the DSP is part of this thing called a circuit model. And uh, now you can use this um, class that you've created as the effect, as the DSP of a plugin. And so let me switch over to an example of this and show you how it works. So I've got a juice project uh, already prepared, um, but just for, you know, because I'm uh, to be comprehensive, uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be used with juice. I just know a lot of people that are doing real time audio signal processing are already using juice for plugins and apps, or I think that this might be um, used, but any place where you would want to do uh, C++ real-time audio processing. This library um, can be used for that. Uh, okay, my juice project, I have this thing called this uh, passive first order RC low pass filter. And I've put it into this uh, file that I've called my circuits um, as just a place where these circuits can exist. And then I also have other ones in here too that we can come back and take a look at. So just other examples of circuits um, that are included. And then to be able to use this as part of your library or as part of your plugin over here, we just need to include that file and say, these circuit, there's some circuits that exist over here that we want to be able to use. And then we come down here and we create an instance of that passive first order RC low pass filter. So we create an instance of it and we call that our effect. And then in our, uh, implementation file, we go over to prepare to play. And in prepare to play, we just call effect.prepare and we pass in the information for our effect to say sample rate and samples per block. And then we can come down here to our process block and we have an effect that we can use. Um, and we grab the channel data from our buffer. We pass that channel data into our effect using this one called process in place. So that is going to take the input audio process it with our circuit, and then put it back on our channel data um, to be able to use. And then we also need to know the number of samples and what channel uh, that it belongs to. Uh, and if you do those three things, create an instance, prepare it, and then add it to your process block, you've got a circuit now that you can build and run in a plugin. So hopefully I went through that very quickly, but um, that's the... Uh, uh, steps. Those are the steps to make it work. So I'll go ahead and uh, I've got this set up to build and load up in logic and show you this low pass filter in action. So this will come up in a second. And what I'm going to demonstrate how it works is with uh, just taking some white noise and putting it through the plugin. Since this is a, a low pass filter, um, you'll be able to see that the high frequencies of the white noise get reduced in amplitude if you look at it on the frequency spectrum. Uh, so let me show you what I've got here uh, in my session. So here's the input signal, the white noise uh, that I'm displaying on my frequency spectrum plugin over here, the span plugin. Um, and then I have the uh, circuit that we built is for this one right here, the point to point um, one. And this is a particular version of it, the light version, which I'll explain uh, the differences between all these things here in a second. Um, and it's bypassed right now. And if I add this one in to the signal chain, you'll see that we get our low pass filter and uh, reduces the amplitude of high frequencies. And so we are, we have now done the modeling of this particular circuit. And if we were to put white noise through a resistor and a capacitor like this and measure the output, we would get this same type of frequency response uh, to it. So. Um, it's doing the, the effect of what would happen if you had these elements that you connected uh, together and uh, were able to uh, simulate that. So that's the, the, the process for how you could do this. And as a developer, um, I can go back and show you some more things here included. So um, this is a very classic kind of circuit, you know, you would see this circuit in as one of the first ones if you were ever to go out and learn about 
you know, how circuits work, this is one of the first ones you would come across this type of low pass filter. So it's very useful and a good place to start. Um, but there's also ways that we can build off of that and uh, have other types. And so the whole circuit library includes many, many, many circuits uh, involved in it. So here's a low pass filter. Here's a high pass filter where these things are already added in. Here's one called an active second order low pass filter. So active means that it has some amplification to it. It has the thing called an op amp. So uh, up to this point, I've just been demonstrating circuits that have resistors and capacitors, but this library also includes other elements uh, like an uh, op amp or operational amplifier, which is another important building block to a lot of audio circuits um, and other elements too that I'll uh, cover in more detail. So um, if you were the type of developer that said, I just want to, I know that I want to have analog circuit DSP in my effect, but I just know that I just want to have a bandpass filter or a um, high pass filter. You just have to look up the names of the ones that are already included and then just come over here to your plugin processor and swap it out and say, uh, let's have a, a passive a second order bandpass filter and rebuild the plugin. And now we have a passive second order bandpass filter instead of the other one. Um, so it's just a matter of swapping out the uh, name of the class or the circuit right here to be able to get all these other different types. Uh, just some other examples. So we have uh, circuits that are based off of a lot of guitar pedals. So if you're familiar with the Big Muff is a famous guitar pedal. You have the tone section that's modeled in there with room, some resistors um, uh, and capacitors in it. So um, those are just a few of the uh, many options that are included. Uh, so let me take a step back and then talk about uh, the different versions of this library. So uh, the technology itself I've called point-to-point -point modeling um, that then can be used um, in, in different ways or with different versions of the library. So um, where you can find this and be able to use this library uh, is off of my website. So I maintain a website called hackaudio.com. And on here, you can find a link to point-to-point -to -point modeling. And from here, there are a couple of different GitHub pages available um, where you can access this. So the one that I've been demonstrating so far is called the light version, the LT. And this is a non-commercial. It's a free um, uh, version to use and it's publicly available. You can go anytime you want over to this GitHub page and uh, download. Um, the library and the example juice project that I've been showing you and be able to use it and just open it up and build it right away um, and be able to use it. Uh, so it is a light version. It doesn't have um, everything included. It doesn't have all 150 circuits built out ahead of time. Um, and it all, also only includes um, a limited number of circuit elements. Uh, so resistors, capacitors, and op amps and voltage sources and um, those kinds of things. Um, there is a commercial version of the C++ library that's intended for people that are releasing commercial software um, on it. And that includes resistors, capacitors, op amps, and then it also includes uh, variable resistors. So things that are called potentiometers that allow you to have parameterized control over circuits. Those are the typical ways that if you want to have like an equalizer where you change the frequency or change the amplitude or those things, uh, you need a, a potentiometer or variable resistor to be able to do that. Uh, but then the commercial version also includes um, uh, nonlinear elements. So things like diodes, um, which are used in clipping uh, distortion for a lot of guitar pedals and even some guitar amplifiers. So you can build circuits that have diodes. Uh, transistors, in particular, a specific type of transistor called a bipolar junction transistor, um, which uh, has two different types um, the, based on the, the doping of this the semiconductor inside of it. So there's ones that are called NPN and also PNP. And there are both types of those uh, transistors um, included in the library, commercial library. And then also a vacuum tube. So a lot of you know circuits that people love, analog, cool sound, saturation, distortion, that kind of stuff comes from vacuum tubes. And so there's a model of a 12AX7 that's included, the probably the most widely used, well-known a vacuum tube um, that uh, can be added to circuits as well. I'm going to demonstrate uh, 
that here in a second uh, on it. So if you are interested in the C++ commercial version of the library, what I would ask is that uh, you would just contact me through the uh, website and I'd be happy to talk you through um, and get you set up on being able to do that uh, on there. Um, there is also a MATLAB version that I'm gonna demonstrate next. And the thing about the MATLAB version is it's not really set up because it's MATLAB, if you're familiar with that, um, to release real-time audio signal processing software. Um, and so what I've done is created the full version of the library as a MATLAB, as MATLAB code um, that you can use and be able to prototype your effect and get familiar with um, how it works. So the MATLAB version uses MATLAB and it uses MATLAB syntax, but it's all structured in a very similar way to the C++ library uh, to be able to use that. Um, and so if you are interested and you're familiar with MATLAB or willing to work with it, um, the MATLAB version includes resistors, capacitors, diodes, transistors, tubes, and everything uh, else as part of it. And it also includes some scripts for how you can uh, test out your own code um, and look at common things like the waveform and the frequency spectrum and stuff built in so that it, even if you're wanting to work with the commercial C++ uh, version of it, um, MATLAB is gonna be a super fast way to prototype it and figure out, all right, is this circuit working? Does it have the frequency response that I want? Do, do I need to change the value of this resistor, this capacitor to something else to get different results on uh, that kind of thing? So you can get the uh, MATLAB version of it. Um, this one is free and publicly available as well. Uh, I'm a teacher. And so I think that you know other teachers that are using uh, MATLAB already, uh, this is a tool that, that um, for you to be able to use. Um, so let me switch over and show you what the MATLAB version is all about. And then I'll you know, show you some more stuff about the demo with the C++. Um, so with the MATLAB version, uh, the idea is to make it uh, very similar. So here's an example of a circuit. This is an active second order low pass filter. Uh, and in MATLAB, when you do inheritance, you do it this way. When you declare a class, um, we have a constructor and then we do the whole same thing as before. So we have a layout, we specify some number of nodes, we set what the uh, input and output voltages are, we declare the particular types of resistors we wanna use, and their values, and we put those into an array that goes into our layout, we find our capacitors, we have our op amp. So the whole thing in MATLAB, even though it uses MATLAB syntax, the whole structure of it is um, very, very similar to what you'd find in C++ to make it easy to go between one and the other and, uh, and test out your things that they're working. Uh, to, included in the MATLAB version of the library, if you were to go and download this on your computer right now, you'll find a script in there called test script. That's the easiest one to just open up and get started being able to use. And so the test script is really for prototyping, where what you would do is go in and find some particular types of analyses and say, all right, I want to look at the waveform, the output waveform or the oscilloscope is how it would be looked at uh, if it were uh, analyzing a circuit. We want to look at the waveform, we want to look at the frequency response or the total harmonic distortion or the DC sweep. These are the common types of analyses that you would look at for um, uh, a circuit and see if it's behaving correctly. Um, so just to show you some of the nonlinear uh, types of the full library, here's one called a tube clipper. And uh, this circuit is one that's based off of a, a, a journal article from the DAFX conference. I can show you what this circuit looks like give you some context for it. So here's a circuit, um, a schematic that we like to be able to translate into uh, some code. So the main new thing here is this component of our circuit is our tube. And so it has some specific nodes that it uh, works off of, one that's called the grid, one that's called the plate, um, or also the anode, and then one called the cathode. And so those are the, the nodes we need to be able to describe um, three nodes in this case uh, for our tube. And then over here, we have our input voltage. We have some resistors over here. Um, we have a voltage source that uh, is up here at the top of 150 volts. Um, and we'll take our output voltage from this uh, circuit up here by the plate of the tube. 
So that's translated over here into our computer code with some resistors, uh, a model of the 12AX7. There's actually three different versions of the 12AX7 included in the library. You just need to pick which one you want to use uh, from different manufacturers. Put that into your layout. And now you have a circuit that you can uh, use. So let me run this. And what we'll see here, the way that I've set it up right now is that it's gonna display the uh, input and output uh, waveform. So this is just a sine wave um, as our input signal. And we'll see the result of the processing um, that there is this uh, cool tube saturation uh, happening. So yeah, our input uh, sine wave is actually relatively small and this is a tube amplifier. So you're getting this huge increase in amplitude that has this asymmetrical distortion. Um, and so this is really one of the cool parts about um, uh, analog stuff that um, unless you do like that component type modeling where you are modeling the actual elements, the tubes and the resistors and how they interact with each other, um, it's very difficult to like write an algorithm strictly just from digital signal processing uh, on its own without the physically informed uh, modeling that uh, would give you something as cool as this kind of saturation. So again, fairly easy to look at a schematic like this and recognize the elements. The here's, you know, we have a voltage source. We just number these things as this being node one, node two, node three, node four, connect the things to it, and then do the processing of it. So yeah, the MATLAB script, very similar. We just need to prepare the circuit and then we do a process of the circuit in here along with you know, synthesizing the input signal and then plotting it. Uh, I'll quickly show you another circuit. This is our active second order low pass filter uh, on it. And we'll switch this over and look at our frequency response instead of our waveform. And here is our uh, resonant filter. So you can see that there's some bump up in uh, increase in amplitude. This is an active filter. Uh, and you get this cool analog you know, resonance uh, thing happening that you know, then can be parameterized and swept around and control the resonance and that kind of stuff. So if you're like a software developer that makes synthesizers, um, you know, the idea is you could have a really cool analog modeled uh, resonant filter that you add onto your synthesizer and be able to use fairly easily without having to do a lot of the modeling yourself. Uh, so that's uh, some stuff about using the MATLAB uh, library. Again, the MATLAB one is free and publicly available. You can download it now off my GitHub page. Uh, it includes all the components of the commercial version of the C++ one. Um, so it's really great for prototyping and uh, being able to uh, do that. So last thing I'll cover and then open it up to some questions is to show you what the uh, the juice example juice uh, projects are like and get a more of a background uh, idea about what the library is, uh, what the library includes. Um, so let me jump over here to the juice uh, ones. I have these two juice projects. This is the light version of it, and this is the commercial version uh, that has more of the circuits uh, included in it. Um, so the main thing here is we have. Um, we have uh, some header files that are included as part of the library and we need to link to those uh, right here. And then um, the actual library itself uh, is, in, is a static library that just needs to be linked um, in here. And then you can go ahead and automatically use it in the uh, Xcode project when you open that up. So here is the, uh, let me pull up the other one to see that. So, the, you have Mac and Windows, you have uh, some header files for the circuit and then the circuit elements. So here, um, this one has all the circuit elements to be able to use the resistors, the capacitors and the op amps. Those ones already laid out. Um, and then the, implement the header uh, to the implementation file um, for the library, that circuit model thing that I talked about where all the DSP happens is inside of there. Um, and then we have the, uh, base class of our circuit that we inherit from that has those common audio callbacks like um, prepare and process a sample or process in place or process a buffer and you have pointers to the uh, inputs and outputs. So I try to make this as 
um, you know, standard or uh, flexible as possible. Um, you can certainly use it with juice, uh, but you can also use it if you're not using juice types and you just have buffers, you know, and you have a pointer to that buffer, um, you can uh, very easily tie in uh, these things. So the library is really set up if you're trying to do real-time audio processing, um, to do it either at the sample level or at the buffer level um, by using these particular uh, callbacks that you can then use with any circuit that you inherit um, from here. Um, the uh, full version of the library includes um, very similar kind of stuff uh, with the addition of some more circuit elements. So in here we have variable resistors, we have um, diodes and lots of variations off the diodes. So if you're familiar with diodes, there's particular types like silicon diodes or the old um, ways uh, you'd find in guitar pedals were germanium diodes. So we have models and choices that you can select between uh, those ones. You have different types of uh, transistors. The BJT transistors are in here. Um, and then also the variations off of the tube and uh, being able to do those. Uh, let me show you uh, then in, I guess, real time here. Uh, and then I'll open it up to some questions. I have this other juice project uh, prepared over here with the um, full library. And let me uh, show you, we have it set up right now. Um, let me pull up the tube clipper tube clipper to be able to use here and also show you the all the circuits that are included. So this one has, you know, the 150 circuits that I've talked about and you just have to type in the name of it right here to be able to use it. Um, we have, uh, you know, different ones from guitar pedals. And this is a Boss guitar pedal. Um, this is a Ibanez guitar pedal, ones that are already uh, built out and ready to use. Um, so there's tons and tons of different options um, that each are going to be unique, Vox pedal, um, and so on. So classic filters, these are your low-pass filters, high-pass filters. Uh, there are ones that are specific to audio, so Baxendall ones. If you, you know, just drop in a Baxendall tone stack, you can easily do that. Um, uh, many, many different ones. Uh, amp tone stacks, so here we've got circuits that are based off of Marshall amps and Fender amps um, and, you know, very boutique kinds of amps, box, tone stacks. Um, so yeah, stuff that if you're uh, just looking for things that are already prepared and built out ahead of time, um, you know, a Marshall Blues Breaker uh, tone stack, those things are, are already uh, examples that you can also check out and say, oh, what are some other ways, things that uh, people have done. So let me quick, quickly build this one and show you the uh, tube clipper running as a plugin inside of uh, Logic. And then that'll be enough uh, for my presentation, I think. So again, if you're interested in this, check out uh, hackaudio.com and uh, feel free to get in touch with me there. Mm -hmm. So with this one, I'm gonna put a sine wave in and we'll see initially that the sine it's just a single tone, and then we'll run it through our tube clipper. We get that cool saturation. We'll get some harmonics uh, that we see on the spectrum um, to be able to see there, uh, to see it, to see it working in action. Uh, so I'll switch over to the sine wave. Turn it down initially. We'll turn on our tube model, <clears throat> and as we turn up our uh, input signal to our tube. Now we're starting to get the saturation. And I guess to compensate for that, let me turn this um, gain control on. Let's bring it down it's over here. All right, so this is post gain. So we can see uh, the saturation happening, but then also make sure it's not clipping. And it goes into our um, hard clipping when it goes into our uh, analyzer. So there's our uh, tube clipper running in real time uh, based on that, off of that model from the paper. So you can see some examples of both linear circuits and also nonlinear circuits if you're looking for that uh, type of analog saturation to add into your own um, tools. So I think with that, I will stop sharing my screen and see if there's any questions or further discussion. Um, 
um, about the library. Plenty of questions. Um, <clears throat> so the first question, which I told them the answer is probably yes. I imagine, I can't really think of why this would be no, but uh, could this be used on a compressor circuit? Great question. So it depends on the compressor circuit. Um, the one of the limiting, limiting constraints right now on with the library is uh, that you can only create circuits that contain these particular kinds of um, uh, circuit elements. So resistors, capacitors, op amps, I've listed all those out. Um, if there's a compressor circuit that just includes those uh, circuit elements, then yeah, it will work on uh, arbitrary circuits. Now, sometimes there are circuits that are really, really complex. And um, this circuit library with MATLAB at least, when it's not trying to do it in real time, uh, if you put in a circuit that has a hundred nodes um, and a hundred different elements, MATLAB might process the data overnight and give you the result in the signal the next day uh, on it. Um, but you know, it will just come down to your computer and its ability to be able to process something as complex as a compressor. Now, I'll also say, as someone that has you know been using this library already a lot, is that um, compressor? A lot of compressor circuits um, will do things like have a special type of op amp that has a special uh, input where it is basically the input voltage is the control voltage, like a VCA, right? It has to be an op amp that can handle a VCA input. And the model of op amp that I've included doesn't have the ability to like specify a separate voltage input to be able to modulate the amplitude of the op amp. So if you come across a, a circuit that requires that, then unfortunately right now uh, that's not possible. But I can say that uh, I already have plans and I've already started to work on um, adding more components or elements to the library um, that will be updates in the future. So right now it just has the ability to do the ones that I've listed out, uh, but already in the pipeline, I'm working on uh, different types of um, uh, transistors. So a JFET is another type and a MOSFET that you'll find in a lot of circuits. I'm working on a model for a transformer to be able to be included there because a lot of people like transformers um, and uh, some other ones too. So yeah, I I, uh, I definitely have plans to add in new models of op amps, but there's kind of just like a uh, only so many hours in a day to be able to add stuff and try and build out something that kind of works with certain subset of elements and then hopefully over time i'll be able to add to it and make it possible to make more and more kinds of circuits so appreciate your uh, interest in doing that and it probably just comes down to whatever um circuit a person is uh, is looking at great um i'm pretty sure the answer to this question is no but uh, oliver moore asks does this lib have oscillators if so which ones um so this is individual components and not oscillators, which would be a collection in the right in saying that? Yeah, that's a great question. So at the moment, the circuits that I've focused on um, are, are audio effects. Um, however, that's another big thing I already have on my list, my whiteboard of next things that are going to come up are going to be um, how this could be used more for synthesizers, you know, for people that want to do that and um, creating, you know, resonant circuits that generate a tone and be able to do that. So uh, again, a lot of times that comes down to like the model of the op amp and having an op amp that can go into some mode of self oscillation um, to generate a tone. And so uh, that's something that I need to add, um, but definitely is in the pipeline for stuff that I want to um, include and make this library expand it from just, you know, kind of your standard classic audio effects to now being able to do more things, including um, cool analog synthesis. Fantastic. Studio Devil asks, what type of solver is being used? Uh, fixed time step, state space representation, explicit or implicit method? Yeah, great question. So uh, I have done all kinds of different circuit modeling. And I teach a class at my university that we go through all the standard types of things, including um, you know, state space, uh, traditional Laplace transform, 
um, bilinear transform methods, uh, modified nodal analysis, and like a DK method, that's discrete Kirchhoff method. Uh, also other ones that are out there like wave digital filters for doing component level modeling. Uh, and I can say that this library um, comes from kind of the more traditional types of circuit analysis um, on it. So not wave digital filters, but um, what I've done with it is over the years of, of, of implementing different um, methods for circuit analysis, I've taken bits and pieces from state space and modified neural analysis and DK method and uh, all these things. And I have kind of come up with my own um, approach to modeling that is um, based off of those things, but not the same as any of those things. And so that's why I've called it point to point modeling uh, is that it is like a, uh, a different uh, approach that um, is not found in the literature or described as any um, of those other types of approaches. They are, I, I, I think that there are, you know, benefits to all of them. And so like we're trying to do something in real time that is efficient and all this kind of stuff, I pulled uh, lots of ideas from state space and modified neural analysis and DK method and the Laplace transform. And I've kind of put those all together to do something that uh, uh, isn't any of those things, but is also similar to those things, I guess is for the person, you know, sounds like they have some experience with it. That's, I guess, what I can share about the the actual mathematics behind it. Okay. I guess that answers the next question from the same person who asks, is the source code of the circuit solver code available to review? Yeah, great question. Uh, at the, the current time, it's not. Uh, it is included as a compiled library. Um, and so that is uh, what I consider my secret sauce of what I'm trying to offer onto people. And um, I am um, also, you know, if someone is interested in learning circuit analysis stuff, uh, I have tons of resources. I have, uh, you know, a whole uh, YouTube playlist of classes that I've taught that go through all the different traditional methods of circuit analysis. And I would be more than happy to communicate and share that with the community and say, all right, if you're interested in actually learning how these different um, techniques work, I can give you, you know, video lessons and lectures that I've done for my classes. Uh, just share those publicly for anyone that's um, interested in actually getting into it and, and, and learning that themselves. Great. Uh, Farida asks, um, a tall order, but is there any kind of parsing method or feature to visualize the circuits you've implemented? Hmm. Great question. This actually was something people asked at the ADC uh, conference as well. And at the moment, uh, I have not worked on that. Um, supposedly other people have worked on it already to kind of do a similar thing. Uh, there's software out there called Spice, um, where you actually have this uh, graphical method of laying out something that looks like a schematic. Um, but I have not uh, put time and energy into uh, doing that. Um, and I actually have that as a lower priority at the moment for stuff that I would want to work on. Um, that uh, for me, trying to add in more circuit elements and make it possible to do more types of circuits is um, it's kind of what I am focused on. But uh, yeah, I also agree that that's really cool. And it would be nice to be able to take all this code and be able to automatically output uh, on stuff. But maybe if there's uh, someone in the a graphics person in the uh, audio programmer community that wants to talk with me, I would love to speak with them about uh, doing this together. I'm sure there are some people that'd be happy to help. Um, <clears throat> Studio Devil also asks, uh, can components be adjusted in real time like potentiometers or values of capacitors? Great question. So the potentiometers are set up to be adjusted in real time. And in fact, there's a bunch of stuff built into the library to uh, automatically do the smoothing of parameters. So that's something that comes up. And really, the smoothing and that kind of thing has to be handled closely to the, the DSP. And so, um, you know, even if someone wanted to you know, do their own smoothing, I think it kind of makes the most sense. You'll get the best results. Uh, by using the built-in smoothing as part of the library. And so um, in the full version of the library that includes uh, potentiometers, there's a callback function where you can set like how often you want the smoothing to happen um, and be able to adjust things. So, you know, you can, you know, use more CPU and have the 
smoothing happen more quickly or over time, uh, less CPU and, and have longer increments in between those things. So yeah, the library is, is meant to be parameterized um, around these variable potentiometers. Now, in real time, um, I don't have the ability to like change values of capacitors, mainly because I've tried to stay true to like what you can and can't do with a real circuit. There's not like a type of capacitor um, that's common that we would use or, or like a transistor where you're like changing the values of those things. And so most things are parameterized around these variable resistors uh, on it. But that being said, the library does allow you to uh, set these things ahead of time. And so there's actually a lot of control for many of the um, more interesting kinds of elements to be able to set them. So yeah, you can set the value of a capacitor, but then like for a transistor, you can set whether it's a NPN or PMP type of transistor, which you'll find in different circuits. Uh, you can set the type of um, semiconductor that's used. So like a silicon or a germanium. Uh, you can set these common types of um, parameters that you'll find in like a model for a transistor. There will be things like a saturation current or a emission coefficient or like the um, quality or the, the those kinds of factors. If you're familiar with like those uh, things that are associated with transistors, those are things that I've exposed as part of the uh, model for them. And you can go in in the constructor and set, I want to have, you know, um, saturation current of whatever you want, as long as it's, you know, ends up with a, a reasonable transistor, um, it will, it will, you, you can um, change all those things. So there's, <laughs> there's a good bit of control, I guess, where you might think of it typically happening in terms of variable resistors and then the values of all the elements um, and try to make, you know, those things that for people that want to tweak and, you know, mess around and find out what happens when you change the value of a vacuum tube to something else or, you know, change the diode to some other value. You can tweak those and, and find out and learn about the results or get unique and different results than anybody else has ever done before. Fantastic. Uh, Gunnison asks, um, do you have a hierarchy of circuits? Not sure. Hierarchy of circuits. What, um, I'm I not sure I what they mean. Um, the organization of the circuits right now um, is, is kind of based on like where they're commonly found. So like there's um, stuff for like guitar pedals. And you'll find like guitar pedal tone circuits and guitar pedal clippers and uh, uh, guitar amplifiers and preamps and tone stacks of a lot of guitar amplifiers. And they're like organized around those kinds of things. Then we have like, uh, we have um, a bunch of circuits that I would just call like uh, uh, analog clippers. So like all these things, it's maybe not a guitar amplifier and it's maybe not a preamp to a console, but it's like a classic circuit that we could just use for cool analog saturation of stuff. We have a bunch of those and then, uh, you know, your, um, Analog filters, so you know Baxendall and Salen Key, and um, you know your standard um, audio uh, ones. We have like stuff based around like, all right, if I'm looking for a filter, I can pull up this folder or this file and find like 20 different filters, um, high pass, high shelf, whatever, and be able to uh, find them that way. I guess is how it's organized if you were looking for a particular thing. Okay. <clears throat> Kostas asks, does the MATLAB version depend on any additional toolboxes? No. So uh, it only just requires the uh, MATLAB main library or the MATLAB software. Um, and I guess it uses, I don't even think the test script just uses a sign function. So it doesn't even require like the signal processing toolbox, but a lot of people have the signal processing toolbox. So you could, you know, swap out sine function for square function and put in a square wave, but you don't even need to do that. You could just use the MATLAB one and then uh, uh, the code that I've created for it. And that would, um, that would work in and of itself. Right. Leon asks, um, 
would with the MATLAB being completely open source, can't you just use the C++ export in MATLAB to export the circuits? Great question. Um, so I don't know if you try to export it, to turn it into C++, um, if you would have good results with that. Um, I haven't tried it. Uh, um, so uh, I actually wouldn't have a problem if someone wanted to try it and see what happens. Um, I do have you know, a license associated with it for personal use um, that if it was for, for personal use, have at it and see what happens, but don't violate the license, I guess is what I'd say. <laughs> Tagrol asks, are the currents and voltages calculated depending on sample rate, or is there any oversampling in the calculations? Yeah, so the library also includes um, some built-in oversampling on it, and that's something that um, I'm also working on giving the developers more control over on trying to find out a good way to do that, um, so that... Uh, because I know that it's something that people want to be able to, okay, it's taking up too much CPU or I want you know, higher sound quality and be able to um, control that. So yeah, there is oversampling um, that's uh, included in it already. And just like the parameterized smoothing control, the oversampling kind of works best when it's at the library level. And so I've included it um, as just native oversampling code uh, right into the library itself. Great. Uh, Metafunction, uh, aka Balin, hi Balin, uh, asks, is the non-linear stuff Newton refs uh, using the Newton Raphson method? So yes and no. Um, it's another kind of thing where uh, I, it's based off of the Newton Raphson method, and then there are some tweaks to it that I've done um, that are trying to make it uh, smoother and also um, faster and less prone to instability. So it's a you know iterative solver derived from the Newton Raphson method with some of my own tweaks to it. Great. Uh, Sam Schaefer says, great talk question for nonlinear circuits. Does the C++ implementation guarantee convergence? If not, are there safeguards to prevent it from hitting infinites or not the numbers? things like that. Yeah, there are definitely some uh, safeguards that are in there. Um, I'm still uh, calling the version of it a beta version specifically for this reason um, that uh, I'm, you know, adding as many of these nonlinear circuits as possible that I know are working to the library uh, as examples of ones that uh, people will have. Um, but at the same time, um, I can't guarantee 100% that every single possible circuit and every single possible input signal is uh, going to work. And so there are some things that like, if if this if the circuit went unstable, it would reset and carry on from there. Um, but uh, it's the type of thing that um, I've tried everything I can to address it with many of the example circuits that I've been um, working on uh, with it and would, love to work with another developer that if they had ones that they were working on and they came across uh, something, um, I'd love to be able to improve the library to make it more robust and handle as many as possible. Great. Um, two questions that are kind of related from Darwin's and Matthew Hill. Um, uh, one is about CPU usage. Um, I know this is this may be difficult to say, but how many instances for relatively complex, interesting design on a modest computer like an M1 Mac? And then um, Darwin's had asked about if the library would work on an embedded chip. Yeah, so this really depends on the circuits that you're trying to implement and then your processor on it. Um, and there is a huge uh, range of um, of uh, CPU usage that you can have uh, with this. Um, from you know relatively simple linear circuits, you could run a thousand instances almost of this probably on it uh, like a Mac Studio. Um, 
because it's just so lightweight and um, uh, for certain types of circuits. And then you could have other kinds of circuits where you're like, honestly, I, I could probably put one together in five or 10 minutes that wouldn't run on my Mac Studio um, because it just has multiple nonlinear elements and too many nodes um, that that's just a reality of trying to be able to do, you know, an arbitrary circuit solver is that um, it's not too hard to put together circuits that are just not uh, capable or our computers aren't just capable of handling right now. I hope in the future that computers continue to get uh, faster and faster. Um, but for like a lot of the common circuits that we find in audio, um, they can be implemented and will run, you know, um, just fine on a uh, person's personal computer. Um, uh, I can say that in my own experience, like, um, like working on guitar amplifiers in particular on it, uh, I usually do things like break up the circuit into multiple stages. And by doing that, you go from having a circuit that won't run on the computer to now having, you know, you've broken it up and that isn't exactly true to how the circuit actually behaves in real life, but it also is not too far off from uh, kind of the independence of these different stages of a guitar amplifier. And by doing things like being intentional about where you break up the circuit into multiple parts and treating them as smaller things with, you know, each of them maybe having five nodes rather than having a gigantic circuit with 20 nodes, then there are choices that you can make as a developer like that, that will uh, make it possible to uh, implement even circuits that have tons of components and tons of nodes, if you um, are just familiar with how to do some of those common types of things that, uh, you know, even if you weren't, if, if, if you were doing this all by hand, you would probably do those, make those similar kinds of choices anyway uh, mm -hmm. on it. So. Hopefully that answers the question. Great. Um, so there's another question that's sort of around the same realm. Uh, what what audio equipment do you use to evaluate the theoretical code that you're creating? Um, how audiophile-ish are you while listening and comparing results? And thank you for the inspiring live stream. Yeah, great question. Um, so in some cases, uh, um, I just take a schematic and implement it or have, you know, someone that works with me, um, do that. And to some extent, we just kind of believe like, okay, this is a tone stack and it has these values, um, of the resistors and capacitors and you put it in and it kind of does that. And, um, maybe we don't have a Marshall blues breaker to actually compare it to, but we're like, well, that's as long as we think that the schematic is true to the real thing, that's kind of the best that uh, we can do. Now, a source of truth uh, that could be used um, if you had a particular one that you were really interested in focusing on would be to put it into Spice. Um, there's like a software called Spice or like a example of it is LT Spice. It's a free version of Spice that does circuit simulation um, that like will do you similar kinds of analyses. It won't it allow you to do like real-time audio processing in a plugin the same way that this library would, but that's a tool that's um, that's widely used by uh, people that work with circuits to be able to lay out a schematic and be able to analyze it and see how it works and you know get some uh, expectation for the way things are supposed to behave. Um, now, obviously, it'd be cool to have every single one of these circuits or be able to you know compare the real hardware to the software and tweak it from there but um, you know in trying to build up uh, the quantity of, of circuits and you know, have 150 of them it's just like uh, hopefully these are just cool effects in and of themselves if they're close to the real world that's great if they're kind of just do something fun and uh, interesting that uh, I hope can be valuable too. Okay, great. Um, so another question from Christian K. I'm not going to attempt to 
I'll pronounce your last name, sorry. Uh, does it does it take modulations caused by different analog components into account? Hmm. Great question. Uh, at the moment, no. Um, I assume the question is somewhat related I, I, um, to like the fact that you know if you were to buy a pack of resistors and you have ten different resistors um, that are all supposed to be uh, 100 ohm resistors, you're going to get some variation between those. You might have one that's 95 ohms and one that's 101 ohms and one that's 100. And so like that's just a reality of working with circuits is like there's just variation um, between them. And at the moment, I don't really do anything uh, in the library to like uh, add in some random variation. I've seen some journal articles or heard of some companies that in their own modeling, uh, they will add in some variation uh, to the components to make them, you know, similar to the variation that happens in uh, real audio equipment. But uh, for me, it's, I've just kind of said, if you want a 1K resistor, you get a 1K resistor uh, at this point. But definitely something that I could look at in the future that, you know, um, could be added in. Great. Okay, one more question from Studio Devil. Um, how does this library compare to uh, LT Spice and other similar real time Spice simulations? Live Spice, not LT Spice. Yeah. So um, on one hand, I would say like my goal is to make a library that uh, is as accurate and true to like circuit simulation as spices um, as you know that's one that's been well adopted and well received and well respected for like a way that if you want to simulate circuits spices um, a good way to do it uh, I have geared mine ex you know almost entirely towards people that want to do real-time audio processing um, and try to make it very intuitive for being able to do that um, where it's for a software developer that wants to go in and write some C++ code and add a circuit effect to their plugin or to their app and be able to get that analog uh, processing in real time. So, you know, you process at the sample level if you want to or at the buffer level. Um, and so it's like meant to be easily incorporated into something like a juice project where like, I guess with Spice, I don't know, I haven't actually kept up with all the new variations of Spice, uh, but for me, the big limitation of Spice has always been, well, it doesn't really export code and it's not geared towards just dropping into plugin or some kind of C++ project and being able to get circuit simulation happening right there. It's a great tool you know, to prototype some stuff and figure out if it is gonna work or not, but it's not geared towards that. I guess some people have, uh, told me that recently there's like there is some way to do somewhat of some like real time spice processing uh, or some real time spice uh, thing, um, which is awesome. I still don't know if it's like meant to be dropped into a C++ project and be able to use that way. But um, yeah, I think spice is great. Um, and, you know, I hope that what I'm trying to create for the community of audio software developers is something like if they're like spices, like great for getting results of analog circuits, try to get as good of results as spice, but then also make it like for the audio developer to be able to put into their plugins. Absolutely. Well, cool. looks like we finally got through all those questions. Wow, that was a lot of a lot of great questions. Thank you very much to everybody who uh, who took the time to ask them and everybody who's taken the time to tune in. And um, once again, check out, if you want to check out the uh, the library and some of the awesome resources that Eric has, be sure to check out hackaudio.com. Uh, he has a lot of great resources there for people who are looking to get into analog modeling or circuit modeling, DSP, coding. Uh, he also has a great book out called, uh, called Hack Audio, which is about getting started in DSP with um, MATLAB, uh, but easily portable to other languages like C++. It was, um, it was a great um, learning uh, for me.
going through that book. Uh, and um, yes, thank you very much, Eric. Really awesome. Thank you. Cool. And with that, we are going to uh, conclude the audio programmer meetup. Thank you so much to everybody who's tuned in. Uh, normally, we do this every second Tuesday of the month. But next month, I'm going to make an exception and um, going to make this the 7th of uh, February rather than the 14th, because 14th is obviously Valentine's Day. There are going to be a lot of people that are going to be out. Um, and um, and so decided to move it back a week. We already have our guests for next month, which I will announce soon. But once again, very exciting. We'll be talking uh, more about some of the exciting things happening in the AI space and um, and also DSP corner with Rachel Locke, uh, as she'll be back next month. I'm really excited. Uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Be sure to join us on the Discord. Uh, once again, that's theaudioprogrammer.com forward slash Discord, and we will see you next time.